what was the first deal that you bought? When did you do that in your career? What was that deal? How did it go? Where'd you find it? How'd you structure it? So we made, within 18 months of buying it, almost 300% on our money. Triple net leases actually seemed fake to me. It was like, why would anybody do this? Because it is a landlord's dream. My first deal I did was 4,800 feet. It was three years. It was, uh, the company's name was Dalton Beauty. It was in uh, Tamarack in, uh, in a prime property fund, Morgan Stanley owned uh, fund. And it was it was the be best thing that ever happened to me in my entire life. <laughs> the whole fee was like 3,500 bucks and I was doing backflips. Yeah. Um, and then I just continued to do more of those and more of those. Like you said, do the small deals and just figuring it out and making lots of mistakes and, and learning and growing. And then eventually found some listings and kind of, you know, went off from there. So starting starting from from scratch alone sounds awful to me today, whether you're me or someone else, I don't care. Yeah. Um, but starting on a top producing team with lots of infrastructure and lots of overflow and lots of kind of smaller deals that nobody really has time to get to, or maybe there are some inefficiencies and in how big they've gotten, how fast, and there's some things you could fix or some value you can add. Um, that's where I sort of made myself valuable and I'm, I'm confident that someone's career could take a five year leap in one year on a top producing team. Whereas if you're on your own or you're at a small shop or whatever, and there's not a ton going on, you're at a like, little sleepy, whatever, residential company, yeah. um, that five years will take you five years, right? Yeah. So it's, it's a game changer. Yeah. And it, and it can even take you longer because I've seen, I've seen people of going with like, Hey, you go with one shop and then it's like, man, that shop didn't like, you know, perform as they didn't give me the, the guidance or oversight that I needed. And they're not, you know, doing deals or whatever it is. And then they go to another shop and then another shop. And then, so, um, so you can still kind of be, I guess, you know, all of those are learning experiences, but, um, yeah, being on a team that is like top producing, uh, because it's reps, you know, it, and it's, it's, you know, reps are going to help anybody, but reps also like from a very high level perspective, um, you know, because they're from day one going to get what, 20 years almost of, of experience, like, you know, from you and from your team of like, Hey, um, you know, I've learned these mistakes, these things over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And, you know, even on the smaller transactions, the little intricate details, like those, apl those apply to the big deals, but, um, you know, getting in the reps of the smaller deals is, is absolutely huge. My first deal that I bought, which was about a year out up from being at Terra Nova was a small 1.77 acre piece of property. It was 1.2 million. And my deal, my, my goal was to go get 10 friends at a hundred grand. Uh, in the end, I think I got maybe 12 partners. We got a loan for 50%. Some people put in 100. Some people put in 50. I had a couple people at 25. But I definitely raised the family and friends for that first deal. And I think I put in 200. Yeah. No, and that's a that's a great way to do it is is do the family and friends deal. And that's so that was that was my thing starting out with investing is, you know, as as I'm sure you're aware, the syndication model has gotten increasingly attractive. I wouldn't say attractive, but popular. You know, over the last four, five, six years, and I think in in a certain sector, it's get, it's gotten a little bad just because it seems like there's a lot of people, maybe with not a lot of real estate experience, that are you know coming in and syndicating deals, and um, you know just because it's really been sourced off the deal. You know, so if somebody has a deal and it's like, hey, this is a good deal. If you have it under contract and the market's been so hot, there's been so much money in the economy that you can find the money. But, you know, the 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 uh, track record and the resume and just the experience of, you know, property ownership and management and leasing, um, you know, those are all different. You know, so just knowing how to underwrite a deal and close a deal versus, you know, running it and adding value to it and all those sorts of things. Um, it's a much different ballgame. So and, and did you find that, you know, as you... So as you started to do investment deals, this this first one that you're talking about, the um, you know the the piece of land. So it was just it was raw land, and then we're yeah. gonna did did you develop it or did you flip it or? So it was a it was an out parcel of a property, and my goal was to do two ground leases, because I wasn't the the REA the restricted agree like the easement agreement didn't allow you to um, split the property, so I couldn't uh, sell them. So the, I couldn't sell it. I had to, if I was going to sell it, I had to sell it as a whole. So my plan was to do two ground leases. 
uh, I was negotiating with a t Taco Bell and a chicken concept when I got a call from Walgreens. <laughs> yeah. And and I never thought Walgreens would be interested because the property was not on a hard corner. It was an, an interior site. And at the time, Walgreens really only did hard corners at lights. So it was pretty funny when we got their call. We ended up doing a ground lease with Walgreens. And then the developer that was building the Walgreens building ended up making us an offer we couldn't refuse. And we sold it to them. So we made, within 18 months of buying it, almost 300% on our money. Wow. That's, which was uh, that's, a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's quite a way to do your first deal. It was, and then and then I did not, I didn't understand about 1031, so we, I, we, everyone just paid their taxes, and then I found another deal about nine months later, and all those people that were in that deal rolled into the new deal. Yeah, no, that's a that's a beautiful thing, and that's actually what I did with my first deal as well. I I didn't do a 1031 exchange, and it wasn't because I didn't know about it, but it was you know almost two years ago, a little over a year and a half ago or so. And the market was just so hot. There was just, there's a su such limited inventory out there that I really told myself. And it was very hard being young and just receiving a big chunk of change and, you know, wanting to actively buy deals. And we probably put, you know, I put seven, eight, nine offers out there, you know, right. but, you know, I said, Hey, I can either pay the tax on it. And that's what I told myself was like, I'm either going to pay the tax. Uh, and, you know, because when you're buying a deal and we're, we're going to finance it. So, you know, I said I would much rather pay the taxes than make a bad real estate decision. For so, sure. especially, like I said, especially being younger and, and starting to build, you know, my investment portfolio, you know, I said, hey, paying taxes is going to hurt a lot less than if I assign, you know, what, one, two, three million dollars of the bad debt to my name. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, uh, that and was that was the call there. And that happens, right? I mean, you know, we we're I'm buying a deal right now, and the sellers are like, "Is are you in an exchange?" Because you know they want to boost up the price. They want to know how desperate I am because people are desperate when they have that clock ticking on that exchange. So, absolutely, it's I don't like a, putting a gun to my head and trying to find a deal. I do think that's when definitely when people start buying bad deals, they try to convince themselves it's a good deal when just pay the taxes. Yeah. And that, that, that timeline, like you said, that, that, uh, that time clock that's just ticking on the, on the 1031 exchange, there's some pressure there. Like I didn't, I didn't really like being under the gun. Like you're saying, it's a, uh, it's a great position to be in, especially if you just made money, but like that, that, you know, uh, time just clicking away of, you know, Hey, you got to buy a deal or you got to buy a deal or pay the tax. It's just a, that's a, that's a pressured feeling, which is, which is rough. Initially when I was learning about the different styles of investing, um, triple net leases actually seemed fake to me. It was like, it doesn't make sense. Why would anybody do this? Because it is a landlord's dream. And so the triple net leases that I was familiar with was just like, you know, uh, CVS or Walgreens, very low yield credit tenant. And, you know, the price point per square foot doesn't make sense by any means, you know, even on a hard corner in a busy street. <laughs> and so um, when I heard about industrial and that the, the you know, triple net leases were very common in industrial, I was like, OK, let's let's see this, because some of the criteria that I have for investing is like I want it value add. I want it, you know, cash on cash is one of the more, you know, um, uh, the 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 ways that I invest uh, for cash flow. And then, um, you know, I, I saw that not a lot of people knew about industrial real estate too. So I saw, saw kind of an open field um, to, to really kind of uh, be able to influence it in, in a well manner um, and add a value in that aspect. So that first deal, I was looking for a safe deal because I wasn't familiar with industrial. So definitely wasn't going to go develop it, wasn't going to go take on a spec project. So the initial first one that I, I looked at was a sale leaseback, but that actually failed. And so the actual one that I first purchased was just one with a lease attached to it. And I actually mentioned to it yeah. for Craigslist because I found it on Craigslist, unsophisticated buyer or seller, excuse me. He was trying to sell it on Craigslist. He had it listed with a broker about a year, a year and a half ago. Then he found like a buddy to lease it out to on a triple net scale. And then he actually recently had a heart attack. And so he was kind of up in age and said, listen, you know, this, this triple net lease, it's great cash flow, but I want to, you know, experience the money 
now, even though I have to pay taxes on it. So we made a really great deal. It actually landed at a 10.9 cap, so almost 11 cap, um, just based on that, the, the actual property, um, the, the lease was uh, like kind of squashed down because the actual tenant improved it so much. So the price point per square foot on the lease was really, really low compared to what it was because the tenant actually probably improved it about half a million dollars. Um, so it kind of checkboxed all the things that felt safe to me, really great cash on cash return. Um, even though it was a shorter lease, uh, I think it had about a year, a year and a half left on a three-year lease, but the option was most likely a pr high percentage of the option being exercised for another three years. And then, um, once again, unsophisticated seller, um, too. So kind of checked all the boxes to hit the high cash flow, really safe investment and kind of go from there. So, um, that was the first industrial investment. No, that's, that's cool, man. And, um, yeah, whenever they, whenever tenants commit that much money to a space, like, you know, that they're pretty committed, um, and even past the three year point, like, have you passed the three year option now? Have you, are you over that? Yeah. So I bought that about a year, a year ago ish now. And so about a month ago, they already sent the renewal. Um, so they were going to exercise the option and gotcha. commit another three years to it. I've noticed like each transaction has its things. Like there's work to do at every transaction. But I remember the first deal that I did that was bigger. It was like 7 million. Um, I've done like, you know, $500,000 deals and like in, in million dollar deals, $2 million deals at this point. But like the, the amount of like, say call it brain damage, but the amount of like, you know, work that is like unnecessary or people just like dealing with other people that like don't have their stuff together. They're not a proof of financing all their records and P and L's and rent roll was all like done on a napkin. Uh, you know, so like going from like the smaller transactions, you're going to find more people that like, um, that don't have their stuff together versus the assets that are like, you know, five, seven, 10 million. It's like, man, these people have, they have CPAs, they have attorneys, they have their bankers lined up. They have like, they have everybody lined up all the vendors and contractors and management companies and, and all those things. And it's just, it's pretty streamlined. And like, everybody is kind of playing at the top of their game where you can really run efficiently as a broker then and not so much do like, all right, let me be your CPA and dig through your like tax records. Let me try and like put together your rent roll for you. Um, you know, stuff like that. So um, that's, that's, that's big on the, on the bigger deals, I think. So uh, man with, uh, I want to shift gears here a little bit and, you know, talk about, you know, you, you branching out now and, uh, and, you know, Oh, I guess even before then, because you started buying deals for yourself before you uh, uh, branched out. So, you know, what was the first deal that you bought? When did you do that in your career? What was that deal? How did it go? How do you, where'd you find it? How'd you structure it? You know, if you could tell us more about that, that'd be awesome. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's, um, the, the first deal I bought that was like strictly an investment deal was a, a four bedroom townhome here in La Mesa, which it's the uh, first city east of San Diego, which is where I live. Um, it was, uh, a, an older woman, um, had moved into assisted living. The house was vacant. The kids needed to sell it. Um, they listed on the MLS, um, with an agent who did not do a very good job with the marketing. Um, I would say that that's been sort of a secret for me finding deals, um, is if you see those cell phone pictures with, you know, and that the house is dirty and nothing is framed correctly, uh, that there is gold. And, and that kind of yeah, stuff. So yeah. they had um, they had put it on for four ninety nine. Um, I called the agent immediately. Met him there in person. Um, I, I found if you really want to lock down a deal, you got to do it in person. That 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 anyone can tell you anything you want to hear on the phone, but but in person is where deals get done. So yeah. we met him in person. Um, I gassed the agent up on the whole, you know, you could be our agent, you can be the seller's agent, and which, which surprisingly is like a foreign concept for, for most realtors. The, the idea was, you know, commercial real estate, if possible, we want to double on the deal. Realtors have been 20 years with, without even realizing you can do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we ended up going under contract at 465, um, did our inspections. Uh, the it was, it was a screaming deal. It would have been a deal at four ninety nine. Um, we struggled to get the financing. Um, it was I, I had had like one good year in 
business at that point. And, and most lenders want to see two years of that. So we knew it was such a good deal that, that we just kept pushing through. And we were super fortunate that we found a private lender um, who was able to lend on it. So we, we closed it. Um, we did a super tacky renovation, um, pro probably the most mediocre renovation uh, I've ever done. But we were we were on a shoestring budget. It, you know, we we bought like the, the cheapest carpet Home Depot had. And we painted the cabinets instead of replacing them. And um, I, for some time, had been doing research into Section Eight uh, housing. Um, there's a lot of anti-landlord uh, sentiment uh, and right control of this kind of stuff in California, as uh, I'm sure a lot of people talk about. So the idea of having guaranteed rent um, and not having to deal with, with market rate tenant was really appealing to me. Um, plus, in this specific zip code, the Section 8 rent was above the market rent. Um, so we we bought this thing for, for 460 um, and we rented it for four thousand a month. Wow. Yeah. So we were we, we were cranking. We we had an interest only loan, so we, we were cash flowing about two thousand bucks a month on our very first deal. We we, we felt like kings. Yeah. Um, about six or seven months go by. Um, I get a notice from the HOA that that's basically like a warning violation that we are harboring a nuisance. Um, and, uh, I, I go over to the property and, and it was kind of like a, like a scene out of boys in the hood, um, that, that, that I, I picked the wrong tenants and, and they started having lots of people over and that they're fixing cars in the common area and smoking and drinking and being hostile to the neighbors. And, and it really, you know, I, I, I had a situation on my hands, so. Yeah. Fortunately, um, here in San Diego, the waiting list to get a Section 8 voucher is over 10 years. Um, it, it's absolutely absurd. I, I don't know how the system would function with a 10-year waiting list. But because of that, the, as a Section 8 landlord, you, you totally have the upper hand that, that the tenant does not want to do anything to risk losing that voucher. So mm -hmm. I didn't hire an attorney. I, I just wrote him a letter myself, basically explaining that. You know, I don't want to mess up your situation, but you got to leave. Like, this isn't going to work. And then uh, without an attorney, I got the tenant out in less than 30 days. Um, so well, you know, that that was a pretty big win. H however, we we had really burnt out our relationship with the HOA. Um, so we decided it was just time to sell the property. Um, fortunately, we, we had bought it in 2021. We sold it in 2022. The market had boomed during that period because of the low interest rates. So we ended up selling it for 705 um, in like less than a year. We bought it for 461, sold it for 705, um, took that money, exchanged it, bought another condo in a different complex where we will, we chose a better tenant this time as well. We bought a commercial property uh, in Lemon Grove, a little two tenant strip center that, that we had come across it and just our bro bridge prospecting um and, and yeah that that was uh i guess the the first deal and then into the next deals yeah no that's that's awesome man so so the first commercial deal you did the two the the, the small two unit shopping center um was that did you still use private money on that one or was it vacant when you bought it like how, how did that yeah get? so it, um we used the same private money lender that we had used on the previous property um, just because we had like a, I think a 24 month loan that we paid off in eight months. So he was happy with the interest he was making and, and was ready to do another deal with us. So we, we have found this thing off market. Um, it was out of town owner property according to being deferred maintenance and had in incredibly low rents. I, I mean, it was like less than $1 a square foot gross. Uh, which, you know, we're talking California, the rent's a lot higher than that. So yeah. fortunately, uh, the tenants were on short-term leases. So, so we just, you know, made deals for them to get out. And then they were both cooperative with that. Um, we had to put a lot more money into the building than we thought. Um, yeah. it, it, it's, uh, it, it was definitely very humbling just because I had been transacting big commercial deals for, for years. And I, I was a bit of a hot shot and that then I buy this you know, tiny little commercial property. And I felt like I was totally in over my head. Um, but we, uh, you know, we, we coughed up the dough, you know, you, once, once you're that deep into a deal, you have no choice, but, but to just make the moves that you have to make. Yeah. Um, 
leased it up. We, we, we had a, uh, a massage tenant uh, move into the first half. Uh, we put up a bunch of money for TI to get them built out and in exchange they're paying uh, what I feel to be a very premium rent. Um, and then uh, we got a salon tenant to move in the other half. Uh, we had renovated that unit on spec. Uh, which I wish I had done that sooner. We, we sort of lollygagged for three or four months with, with, with the unit at bad shape, hoping we'd find a tenant who would fix it up, which, and, you know, 750 square foot tenants are not coughing up money to do their own build out. Sure. Uh, we rented it on spec, and then we leased it, like, in less than two weeks after that. So wow. de definitely a lesson learned that if you get a smaller retail spaces, you're just better off fixing them up uh, in speculation of getting a tenant. But... We, we got the salon in there, and I think uh, on like a cap rate basis for purchase plus what we've spent on, on renovations, we're at like a 10% cap rate on oh, yeah. that property. So it, it's, uh, it's humming along for the time being, uh, but a, a lot of lessons learned. And, and I would say that, yeah, c commercial property ownership is definitely a much more advanced investment than residential.